Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today on a manager's guide to coral reef restoration planning and design. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Reef Resilience Network, NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program and the Coral Restoration Consortium. And we're excited to have everyone join us today. Um, my name is Petra McGowan. I'm the Director of Coral Reef Partnerships at the Nature Conservancy and your host for today. Um, before we dive into the topic for today's webinar, I'm going to go through a couple of housekeeping items for how we're going to work things. Um, so today's webinar is being recorded. It's an hour and a half long, and there is going to be a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. Um, and you'll have lots of time to ask questions of the presenters. Um, there's also going to be an opportunity for question and answer through our online forum um, after the webinar, and we will give you instructions for that um, at the end, and it's an interactive community where you can ask more questions if they come to you later uh, for follow-up. So there's two ways you can ask questions during this webinar. Um, there, you can type your question into that question box to the side of your toolbar. Um, you can also raise your hand during the Q&A session and I can call on you um, and unmute you so you can ask your question yourself, which I love to have people do. So, um, but your microphone needs to be working for you to be able to do that, obviously. So if you're having any technical difficulties during today's webinar, please um, type in the question box and we will try to help you solve those technical issues and get, get it working so that you can hear what's going on. And today we have several speakers joining us. Um, and so uh, they're going to be talking about different components of the manager's guide and um, how it's being used in different conservation programs. So our first speaker is Jennifer Koss. She's the director of NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. And I'm really excited to have Jen here today to kick us off and talk about why this guide was needed and why we all partnered up to jointly invest in pulling it together and making it happen. So Jen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Petra. And thank you for the honor of getting to kick this uh, amazing guide off. Um, I don't have any slides or anything, so don't worry about that. Just wanted to take a few minutes to thank everybody who is involved in creating this guide and to provide a little perspective for why it was created. Um, I think as folks start to get into it and realize the complexity of what's in it, it may prove to be a little bit overwhelming, but I think that's a testament to the amount of knowledge that's been developed in the field of coral restoration and why we felt it was so important to capture all of those different elements and the various steps that we're suggesting folks take in order to um, plan and design coral restoration projects. So um, just a, a quick reminder of, of where we've come over the past couple of decades. NOAA's been involved in coral reef restoration for over 20 years, primarily in addressing acute disturbances to reefs, whether that was a ship grounding or a, a hurricane or something where we would go in, do emergency assessment work, a little bit of uh, triage work to stabilize reef structure and then go back in later to actually restore the reef, especially in cases where um, there was a, a settlement because of a grounding where we actually had funds to go in and do a full restoration. So we've really um, honed our skills based on our, our understanding of coral reefs that was um, developed through ship grounding responses primarily. And that knowledge has only expanded in terms of then um, not only the practice of stabilizing reefs with existing corals, but then growing them in nurseries and in, in, in water and on land and different techniques. So um, then the, just the field of coral conservation itself, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, our strategic plan was really more about providing good water quality and trying to limit um, over extractive uses of corals so that corals would have a good environment to grow in while we were understanding what climate change was going to do. And I think we're all in agreement now that we had to add to that conservation strategy and add active interventions of restoration in order to regain some of that lost ecosystem functioning and get corals back to the point, um, hopefully, where they're reproductive on their own and we buy them some time 
um, to figure out how, how best to acclimate to the new norm for ocean conditions. So with that being said, I'm gonna kick off to, um, I believe Liz Shaver is up next. And again, thank everybody who was um, invested in, in creating this document and hope that it proves as useful as, as, as we think it is. Um, and, uh, and, and thanks again, Liz, all you. Thanks, Jen, so much. Um, Move ahead in the presentation. Um, uh, so thank you all so much for joining us for this webinar today. On behalf of myself and all of the authors of this guide, um, we are really thrilled to share it with you and to share a summary of the content that's that's in it. Before we really get started into the presentation, we wanted to take a quick moment to get a sense of who you are as our audience. Um, so if you could, if you could answer two poll questions that we have for you. The first one is asking about uh, your position in this field. Are you a marine resource manager, restoration practitioner, scientist, or researcher, or student, or other? Of course, we know um, lots of people can wear many hats, but um, your main kind of role in coral reef conservation or restoration. Okay, the results are in, and it looks like we have a really good um, range and diversity of people with us today. A lot of managers, um, a lot of scientists and researchers, um, as well as practitioners, so that's great. Um, and then we have one last poll question for you. Um, okay, we'd like you to tell us a little bit about your work that's related to restoration. Um, are you currently working on a coral reef restoration project? planning to start something new, but not, not yet working? Um, are you just generally interested in restoration? Or are you realizing right now that you might be in the wrong webinar? Let's see if someone in the audience has a sense of humor. All right, and it looks like the majority of people are interested generally in restoration, but there's still a good number of people, about 30% that are currently conducting restoration and 23 who are planning to do so. And one funny person, I hope at least, who um, said that they might be in the wrong webinar. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Okay. So, um, so we'd like to begin with a brief history for the reasons why we invested in developing this resource. Uh, we actually started this project over two years ago and it came out of a lot of conversations we were having with managers and an understanding that um, coral reef restoration as a field was just expanding all over the world so quickly. And this is really fueled by the fact that people are really interested in seeing if it can be used to help mitigate reef degradation or maybe promote reef resilience and recovery. And while a lot of these new projects are, are popping up in, in all major coral reef re regions in the world, um, there is a, a bit of a concern um, because this field is still very new. And in general, ecological restoration in any habitat, it can be very costly, very intensive, technically or ecologically complex, especially considering a complex ecosystem like coral reefs. Um, so we realized that we wanted to help provide more resources for the managers that we were working with to help them plan restoration projects and consider different options that they have before fully investing in it. And at the same time, we also realized there was um, generally just a gap in this kind of resource. Um, so along with lots of partners, we worked with NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program and Restoration Center, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, us at the Reef Resilience Network, others at the, uh, the Nature Conservancy, and many managers with the All Islands Committee, and many other people um, to put together this guide. And in the end, the goal of this guide is to help coral reef managers and their practitioner partners with planning how, when, and where restoration will be conducted, as well as how it can support and complement management rather than take away from management. 
So the guide is structured around a six step adaptive process that at multiple times takes into consideration the impacts of future climate change. By an adaptive process, we mean that the guide is meant to be really flexible and iterative, where you could potentially start at different steps in this um, planning cycle diagram you see on the slide. Um, and, and new information that you get at any one step could be used for you to go back and refine your work, just continuously improving upon um, your plan and your restoration outcomes through time. And I wanna point out that the actual planning component of the guide is the first four steps that you see here in this planning cycle diagram, the, the blue ones. Um, and the completion of these four steps culminates in the creation of a restoration action plan. So what do I mean exactly when I say a restoration action plan? We see this as an important component of an overall strategic plan for coral reef restoration. And that can include an action plan as well as other plans like a monitoring plan, operational plan, or um, more um, concrete um, work plans for each of those things. The action plan is the component that describes the project's goals and objectives, sites where restoration will occur, and the types of interventions, methods, and activities that will be undertaken to conduct restoration. And while we um, describe these other components of a broader strategic plan, um, and we largely point to other resources. Um, for instance, like the monitoring plan, we point to um, other resources that are available. And in this guide, we really focus on that action plan. So as I mentioned, the first four steps are the major steps that we use for planning. And these include um, step one, set goal and geographic focus. In this step, users um, focus on identifying medium to long-term restoration goals and the areas of interest where restoration could be conducted based on those goals. In step two, identify, prioritize, and select sites. Users conduct a process to identify and prioritize sites for restoration based on those goals that are specified in step one. And this process can be done in either a quantitatively or a semi-quantitative way. In step three, identify, design, and select interventions. Users will brainstorm all possible interventions um, that could uh, potentially use, uh, be used for their restoration goal. They use basic and climate change specific questions to design those interventions. And then they go through a process of evaluating those options and selecting the most appropriate ones for them. And then in step four, develop restoration action plan. Users develop SMART objectives that help reach the goal. Um, they identify and list activities and timelines required to meet those objectives, and then um, they develop and create an action plan. So how do we see people using the guide most effectively? There are a few things here that we suggest. The first is that uh, we suggest this process be done for one restoration goal at a time. So the first time going through, you may want to pick your top priority goal and then go back through the process as needed, depending on um, if you have other um, major priority goals as well. We also suggest working with a core planning team that's made up of people that have a collective experience or expertise in um, things like local coral reef sites in your area, like ecological or working conditions in those sites, existing management strategies, um, knowledge of social cultural complexities, and climate change vulnerabilities in the area. In each step of the guide, we help users with the, the process of that step. So we provide background information, we provide a suggested process for how to work through that step, and then we also provide suggestions for stakeholder engagement. We also include a full worked example that's carried through each of those four planning steps to really help illustrate the process. We've also included several tools and resources that can be used alongside the guide. The first is the workbook. The workbook provides a place where you can document the process, any important information or decisions made during steps one through four that planning, that planning process to get you to that action plan. We really see it as, um, as uh, something that you can retain as a reference document 
that has a record of all of the information and assumptions made during that the work that you did uh, for planning. It aligns really closely with the guide. Each suggested process point in the guide matches directly with the workbook. Um, so they really go hand in hand with each other. And it's an appendix in the guide, it's appendix one, but it can also be do downloaded directly as a Word document from the NOAA course website where the guide is located. We also provide an action plan template with the guide. This template um, provides a layout that you can use to build an action plan that's summarized from the work that you did in steps one through four. Um, it's designed to be populated directly from the workbook. Um, so again, all, all of these things um, match and align with each other. Um, we see that the action plan template could also be used to help put together an executive summary or um, a summary that could help support a grant or a proposal. And it's also located as an appendix in the guide or as a direct Word document download. And then finally, we have two resources that accompany the guide that are Excel-based resources. The first is um, a step two tutorial and complete example. Step two, again, is on site selection. And this, um, this tool or um, tutorial provides a worked example that shows how to compile, sort, and analyze data to assist in this process. Um, and then for step three, sorry, at the top, that should say step three. Um, um, evaluation selection tool. Um, this tool helps you compile and visualize results from an evaluation process that you um, conduct to determine what interventions you're going to take. So this um, tool helps you um, process and analyze and then visualize the results um, of that evaluation process. And both of these are available as well as direct downloads on the NOAA course website. So now that we have given you a background on what the guide does um, and how we suggest using it, we're going to switch gears and focus on providing a description of each step. Um, you'll note that each planning step is composed of three subsections, A, B, and C. Um, but now I'm going to hand things over to Jordan West, who will be describing steps one and three, and then Kitty Courtney will be describing steps uh, two and four. Um, so welcome, Jordan. Thanks, Liz, and hello, everybody. So I'll dive right into um, talking a little bit about step one, which is where we identify and prioritize goals, identify the geographic focus of each goal, and then select uh, the goal and geographic focus that you're going to tackle first for the rest of your planning exercise. Next slide. So the first step is to identify and prioritize a set of goals. Um, this is intended now to help uh, you develop some realistic an achievable vision for the restoration work and avoid sort of a trial and error approach in favor of a specific goal-driven approach. So um, a goal is a formal statement that details the desired impact you hope to achieve by conducting um, your intervention, in this case, restoration interventions. Um, goals should be thought of as um, being achieved over the medium to long term and are reached through a series, of, a stepwise series of objectives that occur over shorter time intervals. So in the guide, um, we tackle the goals here in step one, and then after some uh, additional planning steps, we zero in on the objectives later in step four. So next, as Liz mentioned, there's a suggested process um, for how to do this. So at, in order to brainstorm and prioritize our restoration goals, we wanna envision what success of the project would look like. So we've included in the guide this box 1.1, which can be used as a starting point for your exercise. Uh, the goals listed here have been adapted from several different recent resources and are broken into these four main categories of ecological, socioeconomic, disturbance-driven, or climate change adaptation-focused goals. You can use these example goals. You can add additional ones from other resources. You can modify these as you see fit. But we suggest you come up with around three priority goals as a starting point um, for moving forward. Next. The next thing is that in, um, at, at, after you've selected um, a few goals is you need to craft them to be SMART goals. Next slide. SMART goals have the attributes, oops, 
go back one, SMART goals have the attributes of being specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So this table 1.1 from the guide provides a description of each of these attributes and some examples of what they look like. What we're doing here is um, that by spending time to make sure that your goals are as specific and detailed as possible, helps not only communicate to others what you're expecting to achieve with this work, but it's going to make you able to assess um, whether your restoration work has indeed been successful and whether your goals have been met. So I'll give you an example of a SMART goal in a moment. So now you've got about three goals you've identified and you've made them climate smart. You move to the next step, which is identifying the geographic focus for each goal. So here we want to ensure that the sites um, that we ultimately select match up well with our goals. And um, we want to maybe identify whether there's some additional sites that we might want to think about that we hadn't otherwise thought about or start to make note of whether some areas might actually achieve multiple goals. So in the guide, um, geographic focus refers to a broad area where conducting restoration interventions would be most appropriate or relevant to achieving the goal. Now, um, if you click on the next bit, we'll see a map. And within these areas, there will be specific sites um, that you will ultimately do a selection process at that level in the next step. But for now, our goal is to just narrow down what could be a very large area into smaller areas that are relevant to the goal. So in the green, you see an example here of a SMART goal that within 10 years, restore diverse and structurally complex coral reef fisheries habitat. So here we would be circling the areas where coral reef fisheries habitat um, is located that are relevant to this goal. We can also do some other circling exercises, looking at where the overlap is with particular problem areas for those reefs, and even areas where there could be some additional social and ecological benefits from working there. Our suggested process is that you might want to develop a technical advisory group to help with this. And this is actually recommended in general for the guide. Anytime you need to solicit the advice of others who have particular expertise in a topic, you can convene temporary um, advisory groups step by step. If you click on the next bit, we're doing an exercise to map these geographic focus areas um, and, and we're kind of running through two rounds of considerations. What we did in that circling exercise in the previous map was the first column here, functionality and benefits. So we circled those areas. The second round of consideration with our expert group would be to look at management and biophysical context. So these bullets are you know, prompts for things that you might wanna think about in terms of the context of the management that's currently occurring there, or um, if there are any particular challenges or opportunities for conducting restoration in these, in these circled areas. The purpose of all that is to then have a discussion um, and zero in on one of uh, goal that you're going to proceed with. So that's in the next slide. So this is the final step, uh, part of step one, where we select one priority goal and its corresponding set of focus areas to move forward with for planning and design. As Liz mentioned, we're focusing on one goal at a time. That is not to say that your other goals are not important. But if you work your way through one goal um, completely through the process, you can go back and um, do the process again, probably much more quickly for uh, subsequent goals, since a lot of background information about um, sites and even interventions might be common. Our suggested process then, in the next slide, is to review steps 1A and 1B with your experts as needed and select a goal and uh, restoration, appropriate restoration focus areas to move forward with for the um, rest of the planning exercise. And that then takes us forward to site selection with Kitty. The step of the manager's guide is designed to help you identify, prioritize, and select sites where restoration will occur to meet your selected goal. This process involves identifying potential rest restoration sites, using a framework to prioritize those sites. And in the guide, we uh, provide both a example of a quantitative and qualitative framework to do this. And then finally, working again with your technical advisory group and other stakeholders to uh, select or finalize your site selection. 
So in the first sub-step, in step 2A, you will identify all potential sites where restoration could be conducted to reach your goal. The sites, these sites, of course, would be within the geographic focus areas that you had already established in step one. And we, we've defined this uh, site as uh, fairly broadly. It's defined as an area of reef habitat that is within the geographic focus area. So it's quite broad, but we suggest sites should be of similar habitat type with similar depths and areas so that they can be meaningfully compared. Now for the suggested process for step 2A, we recommend at first brainstorming your potential restoration sites and to help narrow down that list, we suggest that the sites that you consider meet some of these uh, criteria, that the reef management is in effect and threats to reefs are or will be under effective management. Reef value is high and it performs important functions or services. Data are or can become available, so data or information can be assessed for a site prioritization process. So those are kind of your initial brainstorming guidance. Next, uh, the second process point is to develop a site list or map, and you can use the same map you, you used before, uh, to, to identify your geographic focus areas and to then locate those potential restoration sites within those areas. So moving on to step 2B, you will use a framework to help prioritize which sites are high, medium, or low priority for restoration. And you'll see on the right, this site selection framework has three main components. Um, one, uh, it has to do with relevance. Will it help you achieve your restoration goal? Is it relevant to your restoration goal? Will um, the site improve, will improve conditions at the site and that corals have the potential to survive there both in the short and long term? These three points uh, are the, correspond to those main categories. And for the coral survival part of the framework, there are three subcomponents. One, the future exposure to dis disturbances. Uh, what is the likely frequency and severity of future disturbances? Two, the ecological resilience of the site. You know, what's the capacity of the site to resist or recover from these disturbances? And finally, human impacts in terms of their types and severity that impact that affect the site. So the first task uh, in, in terms of suggested process for step 2B is to decide how to use the framework for prioritiz prioritizing the site. You can click on the, on the next, which would say that the framework um, can be used in a semi-quantitative or fully quantitative approach. Uh, for both approaches, the end result is a ranking or classification of the potential restoration sites as high, medium, or low priority. Deciding on which approach to use requires collecting available data on those sites and assessing gaps in data and determining which approach to take. So going uh, a little more into detail of each approach uh, uh, in the next few slides, but wanted to point out again, as uh, Liz mentioned earlier, there is a tutorial and a worked example for step two for both approaches that is available on the NOAA Chorus website. So look, look at step 2B. Um, uh, using a semi-quantitative approach. And here, site prioritization is conducted by expert judgment. This means that statements are developed for each framework part, and experts rate the level of agreement with that statement using uh, a five-point scale. So to do this, the first suggested process is to develop the framework part statements and record average responses. And just as an example, in this table 2.3 under relevance to restoration goal, Restoring this site is extremely and directly relevant to achieving our restoration goal. That's an example of a, of a, a statement that experts can then rate as strongly agree with that statement or strongly disagree, et cetera. Next, we suggest that you color code the responses to facilitate a discussion of priorities. And a sample color coding system is given, which can help you um, make the results sort of more intuitive, facilitate discussion about which sites 
kind of jump out at you as being high, medium, and low for restoration. The second approach is a quantitative approach where site prioritization is conducted by compiling and analyzing data for each framework part for all sites being considered. And again, you see here, these are our same framework components as before, but in this part, the suggested process is first to develop metrics and units to support quantitative assessment of each framework part. And on the right now, you can see some of these example metrics. Uh, for instance, the, in the first one, uh, relevance to goal, the metric might be proximity to areas relevant for the goal or potential to improve condition, percent decline in absolute coral cover in the last five years. So the guide provides instructions um, uh, in the second task of this process of quantitative approach. The guide provides instructions on how to generate and normalize raw priority scores, establish relative priority levels, rank sites by priority, and use a color scheme to show the results. So in the next slide, similar to what we did for the semi-quantitative, you can see the qualitative approach uh, and what it might look like. And you see that it's, it's similar, but just a lot more information. Um, and again, this example is provided in the guide and in the step two uh, tutorial. So the final uh, part of step two, uh, step two C is to final, uh, finalize site selection. And you'll take the results from this process and share with your technical advisory group and other decision makers, managers, community leaders, and stakeholders. This step also allows additional perspectives and local site knowledge to be accounted for that might not have come up yet, such as an important social, cultural, political, or regulatory considerations. The suggested process for this step entails facilitating a discussion on site selection, and we provide suggestions for how to structure a meeting and discuss the results of the framework. Importantly, finalizing site selection refers to finalizing decisions about a list of sites. With small scale projects, you may find that you need to revisit this step or adapt your restoration plan with new information on what does and does not work at different sites. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan. Thanks, Kitty. So now with a goal and our list of sites in hand, the next step is to determine what actions to take. So this will involve identifying an array of intervention options and then applying design considerations, including some climate considerations, and then evaluating and selecting the interventions. Next slide. So the goal of step 3A is to identify an array of intervention options. This means brainstorming a list of all the possible options for restoration interventions that could be used to support your goal. The goal here is to think really broadly and not limit ourselves in any way. Um, we'll be narrowing things down later in step 3C. Um, so the suggested process um, to move forward with this, if you click on the next slide, is that we have provided this table 3.1 as a starting point. It's adapted from several recent resources um, and shows a list of interventions that started as common or and or feasible. This list can be used as a starting point for your brainstorming. You can add additional things. You can um, revise these. You can use um, other resources. But this will get you thinking um, about all of the restoration interventions in your toolbox that possibly relate to your goal. Um, one thing that's going to be important to think about is that if you are planning to work at multiple sites, you may have to do this brainstorming um, for to repeat this process for any site or group of sites where interventions might be really different due to the context. So you're going to lay out your full array of options and then in the next step, we're going to think about um, how to design them. The, considering the specifics of how your intervention option would be achieved, and this includes um, some thinking about clim how climate change might affect the interventions. Um, this is going to be a twofold process that includes first thinking about general design considerations that you would think about anyway for using any intervention, and then climate change specific considerations. 
Now you want to go through this process at least in a basic way for all of your options before you do any narrowing down. Because after all, when we get to evaluating and selecting, we want to be really cognizant of the potential of each option based on its design to be effective. The suggested process then is to first just think about basic design. So figure 3.1 um, is where we've kind of created this series of five questions that you see in red, and then there's some prompts for each question to help you think through um, what you would need to think about for your intervention, such as what coral species will be used, where will corals be obtained, what propagation and op planting methods will be used, and then if there are other types of interventions that are going to involve biological controls or physical um, engineering techniques, there are prompts for all of those. Not every question will apply to every intervention, and that's okay. This will help you just check through. So in the next table that we've created, We've um, created basically a template that will have you record your design specifications for each of your option based on those five questions. So what you're seeing in this table um, is in this case, our goal is uh, within 20 years, restore reef structure that reduces wave energy. Now this table is just an excerpt. So we're only showing three out of the five questions just to, um, for brevity, and we're only showing three options. You would do this for all of the options that you've brainstormed looking across all five questions. So you can see here, you're just making some base in um, what would be required for design. So for your propagating and out planning of structure building corals, for instance, you might say, we're gonna, we're gonna start with focusing on two species of digitate corals that are structure building corals, and you know, we're gonna attach them directly to the substrate. Once you've done this basic design phase for each of your options, now we wanna roll in some climate considerations. So that happens on the next slide. Now, there are two categories of climate smart uh, design considerations that you need to think about. The first is how will climate change and its interaction with local stressors of concern impact the resilience of your intervention effort. So for instance, if increased temperature and precipitation could interact with local pollution runoff, and that could exacerbate bleaching or macroalgae blooms, those might be things you need to consider in terms of their effect on your success. The second category is how will climate change affect the physical functionality of the restoration intervention, like through direct impacts on structures? So for example, if increasingly intense storms could threaten physical destruction of either natural or artificial structures that you put out. So this chart in table 3.3 is um, we put together to kind of, again, give some thought provoking prompts. So again, this is just an excerpt. You're only seeing two out of the five. For each category of climate smart considerations, we've given some prompts to help you think about, again, for each of your interventions, what, what might I need to be thinking about here? So, um, you use this to think about adjustments that you need to make. So in the next um, slide, we see that we can then go back to that table 3.2 where we did our basic design and we can, in the blue, we're starting to roll in some climate smart thinking. So instead of simply, uh, we're gonna pick a couple species of digitate corals, we might specify species A and B will be used because they've been found to be more resistant to bleaching and or are found to be more robust to wave energy. Likewise, we might specify our adhesive um, to be a particular type that's been tested to be, to be standing up well. So the goal here is to use this information to think about how you would need to adjust either your species or your manipulation of your species or your timing or your location or your engineering design um, so that you could ensure that your intervention would be successful and resilient both today but also under, under changing conditions. And then this step three, this final bit, is to prepare then a summary description of each of these options. Um, so now instead of just uh, the option is just called propagate and outplant structure building corals, there would be a paragraph that would basically synthesize in a very concise way everything that you thought about for that option that would specify um, the design choices and some of the climate smart thinking in, um, in, in, a, in a very concise way but a way that we could now start to be getting a sense of the potential of different options to be designed to be resilient. We take those summaries forward then into the next step, which is evaluation and selection on the next slide. 
So now it's time to now it's time to narrow down our, our list of options to a more limited combination that's more realistic. So the first process point is to think about how we're going to do this. We need to think about evaluation criteria and process. This figure is just um, showing some different categories of criteria that we need to think about. So we do suggest some kind of formal consensus building process that's based on um, a transparent set of criteria that you figure out. These are just some categories to think about. In the next slide, we've actually provided a table that you can use um, for evaluating and rating where we've kind of um, delineated some sub-criteria under each of those five categories I showed you. So again, the ta this table is only showing the first two categories, effectiveness and feasibility. You can see here that like all of that design thinking that we've been doing up to now is really going to be super relevant for this effectiveness criteria um, about technically effective at achieving the goal and being climate smart. But as you know, there are many other sub-criteria under feasibility and other things that you need to consider in making your decisions. So this table lets you list out all of your options, um, one, two, three, out to the total number that you have. And your um, expert, expert group can go through and, and uh, give ratings for their agreement at the um, evaluation criteria being met for each of these options. Notice that um, there's something called that you, you get an average rating for each category, but there's something called rationale where each evaluator really should be um, putting down their thought process. Because at the end of this um, process, you'll have a big table and you'll, um, in the next step of the suggested process, you will be um, getting your team together and getting your group together to discuss what it really means for what combination of options are we going to select. And there may be considerations such as options that depend on each other or need to be sequenced with each other or affect each other. Some options might even be combined into a single option together. And all of that should be um, evaluated with the group. Um, in order to come up with your final set of priority activities that you're going to move forward with. And we have provided this Excel tool um, that you can use to fill out that table and it will generate a visualization for you for discussion with your group. And this is again available for download on the NOAA Chorus website along with the guide. So once you've got your uh, intervention selected, you're ready to move on to your restoration plan. So back to Kitty. Thank you, Jordan. So step four is the final step in the manager's guide, uh, and it culminates in developing a restoration action plan. And for, for many of you, maybe this is a, um, an activity you've done many times before. It involves defining smart objectives, developing activities and an implementation time plane, frame, and using everything you, you've uh, figured out to date to put together a plan of action. In step 4A, you identify performance metrics and use those to define your SMART objectives. Here, performance metrics are used to quantify the results of your interventions and help you monitor progress in order to determine if, if they have been successful. Objectives are like your goal statement, but while goals are medium to long-term visions, objectives are shorter outcomes over one to 10 years that can be used as benchmarks to reach your goal. Just like rungs in a ladder, these are different benchmarks to get up to the top. The first suggested process point is to identify potential performance metrics relevant to the restoration goal and interventions. And we provide table 4.1 in the guide to help you identify performance metrics that could be related to your goal. It describes indicators and data outcomes for different goals, and you will see that we've crosswalked um, the goal statements from step one that uh, here on this table, and you can see like an example is circled in red. The second suggested process point is to craft SMART objectives, and this is very similar to what you did in step one with with your SMART goals, but these objective statements are really the focus of, of being SMART, which are, as you know, they are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. 
And you want these performance metrics to provide some critical details um, in your in your performance in your smart objectives. In step four B, with all the other information on your restoration work in hand, you can now develop a list of activities and an implementation time frame that describes how you will complete the work. This, this uh, step suggests developing a table of activities and time frames to achieve each of your objectives, and you might have multiple objectives. Uh, there are two rounds of this as well. First, with restoration-specific activities, and second, with any other reef management or community engagement activities that are still needed to support the restoration project. And we provide an example for a table like this uh, based on the example goals and, and objectives. So finally, in step 4C, the last section, is where you compile all the information gathered throughout the process and documented in detail in your workbook and summarize it to build your restoration action plan. You can use a template we provide, which is aligned by step with the guide and the workbook, this template, as Liz mentioned before, is a, found in Appendix 2 of the guide or can be uh, downloaded as a Word document. Importantly, not all details of your planning process or that are described in your workbook need to go into this plan. The action plan is meant to summarize key decisions and highlight some of the process used to making those decisions. With that being said, however, we recommend highly recommend maintaining your workbook as a supplementary document to, to carry forward that detailed thought process, assumptions you've made, decisions you've made along the way. So with that, I will turn it over to Liz. Thanks, Kitty. Next slide. Um, so while we've gone through the four planning steps in the guide that lead to the development of a restoration action plan, there are two additional steps that are important for your work in restoration and the continuation of planning and design. These include step five, implement restoration, and step six, monitor and evaluate progress. These last two steps of the guide are together as one section called moving into action. And in this section, uh, we provide some key considerations for both steps, as well as uh, we point to really important and relevant resources for each of those topics. Um, and while these steps seem like they may be different or kind of outside of that planning process, um, we really see that they're all related in this continual and iterative process of planning, trialing and implementing, evaluating and adjusting or adapting your plans as you move um, maybe from smaller scale pilot projects to larger um, full scale restoration. And that's why we've um, included them all here together in this planning cycle diagram. One resource that we point to um, a lot in the manager's guide and we wanted to mention here is a new, um, is the new coral reef restoration monitoring guide. These two guides are really complementary of each other. Um, so while you can use the manager's guide to develop a restoration action plan, that action plan component of an overall strategic plan, you can use the monitoring guide to build your monitoring plan. And this is a really great resource for identifying those performance metrics um, that you'll need for your objectives, as well as um, it provides suggested methods for conducting that, um, all of those different types of monitoring, um, specifically for coral reef restoration. So we just summarized the content in the manager's guide and the process that we suggest you can take to plan restoration projects in your location. Um, we'd like to end with a description of what we think is the most critical component of the guide, which is of course its real world use and application. Um, from its inception, managers from around the globe have been uh, really critical um, players in the development of this guide by reviewing and testing its content. And over the past year, we've, as we finalized this resource, managers from the US Pacific jurisdictions have actually been piloting this process and using it um, to develop restoration plans in their sites. 
Um, so I'll share with you just a little bit about this process, but then we have two of these managers who are with us today who are going to share some of their insights and lessons learned. Um, so this multi-site uh, workshop was made possible through a grant from NOAA's Restoration Center. Um, it was, um, this project is um, really made possible through the Nature Conservancy's Hawaii program and the Reef Resilience Network as major partners, um, as well as the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program. Uh, we worked with the U.S. Pacific jurisdictions, which are Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Each, um, each of these uh, jurisdictions had core planning teams, which was made up of one team lead. This is someone who was from the leading management agency, um, as well as five to eight additional um, people who were part of those teams. And then each team, we also included a coach who was part of the manager's guide author team. Generally, our timeline over this last year was that we worked from February through March on step one, April through May on step two, June through September on step three, and October um, through now, <laughs> we're still working on step four. Um, but this is all remote work with all four jurisdictions as well. And along the way, we provided um, expert uh, mentors were available for each step. Um, they helped review the workbooks that go hand in hand with each step of the guide. Each of these teams worked through the step, worked on their workbook, and expert mentors provided feedback and comment um, um, in documents and on calls. And now I'd really love for everyone to hear directly from the managers um, themselves. And I'd love to thank Georgia Coward and Whitney Hoot for joining this webinar today to reflect on some of their experiences. Um, Georgia Coward is a coral reef ecologist with the Department of Marine and Wildlife Resources in American Samoa, and Whitney Hoot is the Reef Resilience Coordinator for the Bureau of Statistics and Plans in Guam. Thank you guys uh, so much for joining us today, and I have just a few questions to ask you about your experience going through this guide and going through um, restoration planning in general. Um, so my first question is, um, what do you think was the most useful thing about conducting a planning process um, like the one in the manager's guide for uh, restoration in your area? And um, maybe Georgia, do you want to go first on this one? Hi, thanks Liz. Just want to check that everyone can hear me. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing um, that going through this process really did for us in American Samoa is that it gave us the chance to get everyone into the same room, um, so to speak, now in 2020, but put us all in the same space to really say, what is the goal of restoration here in the territory? We're a little bit different to some of the other Pacific jurisdictions because we're still in the very early stages of restoration here. And I think actually that's worked to our advantage because I feel like we're doing this sort of in the most cohesive and effective way by using this plan to sit together and say with our team members and other stakeholders that are involved in restoration, what are our goals? What do we see that is achievable and realistic? And how do we want to take these goals and then communicate those um, to community members here, chiefs, local leadership, and also other partners that we have on island? So I think going through the process together that way has helped us to really understand what we want from restoration and how to move forward in the best and most effective way for us. Um, and yeah, I think it's just for us identifying the way to move forward, how we want to see ourselves in the next five to 10 years, and then also incorporating lessons learned from other places or other places that we've all worked, bringing those into this plan. Um, it's also helped us think about things like permits here on the island what do we need to do with our permitting process to get everybody um, under the same regulations? What are the conditions of these permits? And also, do we want to have an island-wide database so that we can track restoration? And that all sort of fed into more of the step three, step four of our, our plan. So just having the opportunity to be in one space and uh, make this as efficient and a, and a plan that is as effective as possible. Great, thank I you. I would agree with um, everything 
uh, Georgia said in, in terms of the importance of having a goal. And, um, you know, I think we were, we were already doing some coral outplanting. We already had a coral nursery. Actually, we had just established our second nursery when we kind of started this process. But I, I don't know that we were thinking as strategically as we could about what is the actual objective other than to put more live coral out onto a reef. You know, we knew we had certain reefs where we had lost a lot of coral cover. We knew, you know, more or less what tax we had lost. But thinking about what is the actual goal? Do we want to increase fish habitat? Do we want to increase coastal protection, et cetera? So that was really helpful in terms of just being strategic and thoughtful. Um, I think, uh, and, and, and Jordan touched on this when she was talking, but something I really liked about this process was that all, most of the steps, they really started with this very broad brainstorming where you consider all possibilities. And that was really useful for us to kind of think without limits and say, if we, if we had all the money and all the time, that we, you know, the dream <laughs> that, that we could, what, what would we do and where would we do it? And then kind of narrowing down based on uh, what, what, you know, what do we think is the feas feasibility of this particular intervention or the feasibility of working at this site? And what do we think is going to be our outcome? And, you know, then starting to look at our limitations, our time, our, our budget, our staff power, and considering really where can we get the most um, bang for our buck? So that was really, really helpful to kind of go through that from thinking broad to kind of narrowing down and like, this is what we do in an ideal world, but what, what can we actually do to get, um, to have the most benefits for our reefs and our, our human communities? All right, thank you both. That was really um, insightful and interesting to hear. Um, my second question for you both is um, a little more logistical, um, just asking how uh, your team worked together to um, go through this planning process. Um, for instance, did you need someone to kind of facilitate the group, um, do logistics, do work on uh, workbooks? Um, how did you kind of find that your teams worked well or, or maybe not well um, to go through a process like this? I can kick us off, uh, Whitney. So um, the first thing is, is that this is how, you know, we did it here. And I have to recognize that everywhere is very different and we work with different people and, and things work differently. So I think that's one of my pieces of advice for people uh, that want to undertake this process is find what works best for you guys, because that's where you'll make um, the most valuable product at the end. But for us, uh, we definitely worked by having somebody as a dedicated uh, note taker and we actually worked directly into the workbook. So during every session, whether it was an in-person or a virtual session, we had somebody that was directly inputting everything that we talked about, notes and everything directly into the workbook. And then we would go back to that. Once we finished the meeting, two to three of us would go back through those notes and sort of format everything, revise everything as best as we could, and then send that back out to the team. And also this wider technical group that I think Jordan mentioned earlier. Um, so we had our core team, and then we had a wider technical group that was filled with stakeholders, community members, uh, community leaders, management, that had any form of stake or you know needed buy-in for restoration. So they would then also be able to review each step of our workbook um, and provide perspective and insight to us as well. Uh, having a facilitator was also really useful for us. And most of the time, as the local lead, I acted in that role as well, just to keep things moving forward. And on that note, I think having a local lead was really, really beneficial for us, particularly this year, as things were completely crazy and everything kept changing. Having somebody where this was one of their main priorities and keeping it focused was really important for us. So I was able to keep setting those deadlines to make sure that we kept sort of moving forward and didn't have to hit pause too many times. Um, I kept providing updates as well to management, leadership, um, partners, and so on, so that it was still in everyone's radar, but I was sort of trying to push push it forward and, and sort of keep keep moving through so we didn't lose you know, participation and interest um, with other uh, team members and the wider group as well. 
And then just to bounce off that, my final point, um, something that worked really well for us was having, having those deadlines. So um, I know that we had a lot of help and deadlines set by TNC and so on, but setting them within us uh, locally was really good. So I could sort of keep everybody on track and say, this is our next deadline, we've got to keep up to this, and then we can uh, move forward from that. So I think keeping it sort of focused um, was really important for us. Yeah, and I think um, we had very similar experiences in Guam and, and like American Samoa, we're a small territory. We don't have a, a vast array of people to work on a project like this. Um, so when we're talking about our stakeholder experts, um, we did have one big stakeholder meeting with about 35 people in it when we were doing site selection because we knew that that would be um, controversial and um, probably elicit the most the most input as opposed to when you're talking about um, restoration techniques, which when you get into a broader community, people don't um, have as much knowledge about them. But people definitely wanted to have a lot of input and we wanted to give them the opportunity to have that input on where are we doing restoration. Um, and I really liked the quantit, we did kind of a semi-quantitative version of the quantitative framework and that really helped us, I think, in that stakeholder engagement process because we were able to show we've, you know, we've looked at all of these numbers. We got a, uh, input from a lot of um, kind of outside experts on Guam, outside of our six-person local team, to um, to say this is these are all the numbers that we've come up with um, based on these kind of um, rankings that were done by different experts. So I was, uh, like Georgia, I was the local team lead, and I also think that that was super important just to have someone kind of managing the logistics, uh, scheduling meetings, staying on track. Um, I did the majority of kind of the workbook drafts, and we also worked directly into the workbooks. Um, I would say for the most part, we followed, we probably like 80 to 85% of the follow process we followed to the letter. And there were a couple of points where we deviated just based on how we thought we could organize it best for our team and our stakeholders. But I think overall, we, we stuck to the process. We tried to stick to our deadlines. There were definitely some things that got in the way. Um, we, spent a, we put a lot of time and thought into doing this um, because I, I think this is one of those things where the, the, the process is almost if if not maybe more valuable than the product itself it's really having the opportunity to think everything out and think critically and um, analyze your actions um, i'm sure we will also reference the the um, the guide the that we produce but i think that just going through this was really helpful and something else that we did and i think this probably helped us um, have maybe more buy-in and a little more legitimacy is when we when we chose our team, we selected, you know, kind of the most appropriate individuals from different agencies. So we've got the Bureau of Citizens and Plans, the Guam Environmental Protection Agency, the University, Department of Agri Guam Department of Agriculture, and then um, also our NOAA liaison. So we kind of have a mix of people so that they were able to pass up information and updates to their respective leadership um, at their agencies. And I think that that was really helpful to kind of get broad, broader perspectives in, you know, what was a relatively small team do, doing the majority of the work on this. Great, thank you both. Um, and then my last question for you is um, whether you have any lessons learned that you wanted to share with others. Um, for instance, if there was anything you think made your team really successful or that you might do differently in the future um, if you are going to go through this process again. And maybe we'll just stick with our order, um, Georgia, if you wanted to go first. Yeah, we've actually touched on a lot of the points that sort of we've learned going through the process already. So I don't want to repeat myself too much and I want to keep everybody awake. Um, <clears throat> so again, lessons learned, I've already mentioned, but having those deadlines, just keeping this as a priority because <clears throat> these sorts of things can um, be extended and drag on if you're trying to do it independently. So I think having somebody 
that is sort of the central point and keeping deadlines and keeping the focus focus so that you work through the process and have that you know product at the end um, so people see something tangible from all of these meetings um, I know for us we struggle and Whitney you've mentioned this as well from this concept of meeting fatigue because there's such a small work pool here of you know relevant partners and stakeholders and scientists in American Samoa so it's always that's always something that we have to overcome as a territory with any form of sort of long long process or development of a product so we're still working on that uh, if anyone else has any tips on how to <laughs> get through that please email me um, but I think keeping everyone engaged was something that you know we've we've pushed to try and and um, you know maintain throughout the whole process um, I think my advice to people that want to do this um, work through this process is uh, a rewatch this webinar so you can see the entire format of everything um, and then really look through the workbook before you sit down go through the guide go through the workbook understand the process in each of those steps and know what you're working towards and then I think you can um, stick to it fairly well but also uh, adapt it so that it's the most effective tool for you as you know a group or an individual or a territory or so on because that's what's going to make the plan at the end the most um, efficient and the most valuable um, so that's sort of my biggest thing of advice is read through and, and know where you're going to make it effective yeah and i would agree with all of that again um i think that having the the small centralized team was really important i think if we'd have much more than six it would have become really hard to get everyone together to schedule meetings to keep everyone on track it's that kind of uh that issue of you want to engage your stakeholders and you want people to have the opportunities to give input early and often but you also want to be effective so I, I certainly think that's a challenge and I think that having a, a core team and consulting outside stakeholders either individually or with broader stakeholder meetings to provide updates and get input is um, a really useful part of the process and something that's kind of essential to getting things done in a timely way. Um, I, I definitely recommend, so we at the very beginning, we came up with three restoration goals and now we have a draft action plan for one of those goals. And it has, I mean, I, I guess we started in, in March maybe. Um, so it's, it's certainly, um, and, and that obviously, I think that process got drawn out by, by 2020 and what a year it's been. But um, I think that that was really good um, to, to really just focus on one of these goals and then move through the process. I don't think I'd recommend like trying to do more than one goal at a time. Um, and I, I think that that we the goal that we picked to work through first was the one that we thought we, we thought about who was on our team and who would have the most insight into that very particular goal. And also generally which one we thought would be the most straightforward um, since this would be the first time we were working on this process. So I would when you come up um, anyone working on this process when you come up with these goals, I would recommend putting a lot of thought into which goal you pick to move through for the first time. And then considering when you look at goals two and three or four and five, however many you have, um, whether there are other people who could um, be, you know, who would be better experts to have on that local team. Um, I know that, and I think again, that helps with meeting fatigue. Like are there, you know, are there other people who can, who can help in other stages of this process, particularly if they've been engaged in stakeholders in the first goal? Um, I think people, it kind of helps build input, uh, interest and buy-in in later stages of the process. And I think there's generally um, people want to be, uh, want to be engaged in this kind of thing and have some, um, some insight into the decision-making process. Um, yeah, I think that's probably mostly what, what I have with lessons learned. Um, it was, We've put a lot of time and energy into it. And I think we did a very, uh, I'm, pr I'm proud of what we did. I think we did a really thorough job. And I think um, I think the if you don't do it thoroughly, I don't know that there's a point in doing it thoroughly, but I think it's, it's I don't know that there's a point in doing it because you have to really consider so many things, um, both from like a scientific perspective and also from, you know, from a management and a human community perspective. 
Um, but I think, I think we have a, a really good product and the process has been a huge learning experience in terms of figuring out what, what exactly does success in restoration look like and, and how can we get there? Great. That was um, really insightful and really interesting. Um, thank you both again so much for um, just uh, kind of reflecting a bit on this process and, and sharing your thoughts with others. And I think it's just really interesting to hear how things really touch down in these different locations um, and, and some of your advice for others. So thank you both again. Um, and at this point, we'd love to turn it over to questions. Thank you all for um, just joining us for the webinar and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so can I get the panelists to come back up and I have some questions that are coming through here. So um, first of all, let's see, Ernesto, I see you're still on. You have a comment in here and I wasn't sure if it had a question to it as well. Would you like to, um, if I unmute you, do you want to share your comment or is it a question? I guess is my question for you, but I'll start in case you want to unmute yourself and join us. But uh, Ernesto uh, is a colleague of ours in Puerto Rico and he um, commented that it seems like a great tool, but um, when proposing to restore or repair corals affected by hurricanes, for example, they have to cost effectively intervene at damaged sites in order to seek FEMA funding. And so kind of um, commenting around, you know, is this tool adaptive enough, I guess, for that? Or um, do you, can you see it being used in that kind of um, situation? Liz, I don't know if you have comments on that or any of you, but, uh, or Ernesto, if you wanna pipe in and ask that in a different way because it wasn't exactly a question but I think there's something there interesting that you're trying to I, apply I your it, restoration. I could take a shot. Yeah. Petra, yeah. Hi Ernesto, Kitty here. Um, I Hello. think you're, Hola, you're Kitty. thinking about, hi, I think you're thinking about um, maybe that cost benefit analysis that might need to be built in to help get that kind of FEMA funding. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, correct. And sometimes uh, we you know, have the expectation of intervening uh, with the best options available, but maybe uh, because of that benefit cost analysis, uh, we have to, you know, go to our lower uh, uh, alternatives. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I know you've gone through and done a lot of this work and I'm not as familiar with how to, how to do that for FEMA, but I su suspect that there is a great deal amount of information here and data compilation and analysis that would help support that kind of a cost benefit analysis because you're really trying to be uh, cognizant of what, uh, what you can do, what your goal for achieving that in. And also, you know, you, you could say, well, if we didn't do this, this is what's going to happen. So you can kind of uh, work out what the cost of inaction would be um, compared to actually moving forward. So I, I think there's probably, it, it doesn't have a direct relationship to what I think you're asking for, but I think the information would help you get there. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kitty. Um, I'm going to call on Susan Jackson. Um, you had a question, Susan, that you'd like to ask? Can unmute you. Susan, can you hear us? Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I just want to thank thank you all for this overview. It's been very helpful. And as I mentioned in my written comment, I look forward to taking a deeper dive into the document. Um, so again, you, you this this worked. I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, the approach seems very strategic, very thoughtful, and just two thoughts I had as I was listening. Um, this approach seems readily adaptable for a protection of excellent and good systems, so to prevent degradation, as well as um, broadening the framework to include 
a mosaic of critical habitats that support the biota that rely upon multiple habitats, such as fish species that rely upon the quality and the relationship between coral systems, mangroves, and seagrasses. And I'm just curious, particularly from Georgia and, um, and Whitney, has there been any consideration or thought or relevance for your work um, to apply this to a broader setting or to focus on prevention and protection? Um, anybody on the panel? Just curious if that has come up at all. Um, I will say, I don't know that we looked at it specifically in terms of prevention, but something that we did discuss a lot in site prioritization is when you're picking a site, do you pick the most degraded site to restore or do you pick a site that's doing okay but could be doing better? Um, and that, mm -hmm. that was, you know, what, what exactly is feasible to achieve and where is the best place to, to really dedicate our resources? And a couple of the sites we picked um, as priority sites are not highly degraded sites. They're sites that because of particular reasons, either because of their um, cultural and recreational value or, you know, the unique coral taxa that they have, um, we decided that they were really important for priority sites for restoration um, because we know that de more degradation is, is coming. Even if we manage all of our local stressors, we're gonna continue to have bleaching, et cetera. So we did decide to pick certain sites that um, you know, could probably maybe don't, wouldn't be seen as like the highest need for restoration if you were just looking at their level of degradation. But that all really played into this um, quantitative site selection process that we did. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of discussed within your within your panel and then with stakeholders about where you put your priorities for those that with a little bit of work maybe could be restored to a higher degree versus those that are really degraded and will take a lot of work. Was that part of that public discussion? Yeah, absolutely. That was a huge part of it um, and something that we talked about both in our local team and then um, you know, it was it was one of the criteria, um, actually one of uh, sev pro probably several criteria for that played into the site selection. And when we did that, we actually we separated um, our values into we had like biological and ecological metrics that we looked at, and then we had social um, and economic metrics that we looked at. And looking at a site, um, you know, you may you're not necessarily going to get the highest score if a site is heavily degraded, like if like water quality was a very important indicator. And, and we weighted all of these indicators when we did our site selection. So if a site has poor water quality and is degraded in that way, does it even make sense to do uh, restoration there if you know, you're kind of setting your corals up for, for failure if you put them into an inhospitable environment? So that, that was definitely like a really important part of our discussion with our broader stakeholder group. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one more question, but I can hold and wait my turn again, so I can go back in line. Yeah. Thanks. If you could hold on, I got a couple other I'm going to try to get through, and we'll see if we have time. Sure. Um, Thank you. Thanks. So um, this one, I'm not sure who wants to answer, but let's see who feels like they can, they've got it. Um, so is fisheries production a consideration or an indicator for ongoing restoration efforts? Um, if so, are there examples of how productivity is being monitored and evaluated, or are there examples of how managers demonstrate if productivity is or not correlated with restored corals? Thank you, Mike Lehmeyer. I'll take a first stab and then happy to have other people join us. Um, I think that the question around fisheries production um, it really depends on your goal in the end. If your top goal for restoration is to restore fisheries productivity in that reef system, then that would be the large part of what you are really focusing on and your interventions would play into trying to achieve that goal. So for some, um, the restoration goal might not have anything to do with fisheries, um, but of course is a, is a, um, a great benefit, but maybe the, the goal really is, a, is around uh, biodiversity of corals or 
um, and endangered species or even coastal protection. Um, and that would change the way that you think about your intervention. In terms of examples, um, not to my knowledge, um, there's not as much um, in the way of examples of restoration done specifically to enhance fisheries. I think there are a couple of ways you can design your interventions um, to achieve that goal, um, depending on the fish species. Um, for instance, if a particular species that you're looking to improve, let's, let's say a really commercially important one, um, that kind of habitat that is important maybe when they're in their intermediate or juvenile phase, um, you might want to look into ways that you could design your, your interventions to enhance that habitat to, to improve that population. Um, in terms of actual examples, um, I don't know of many, um, in, in, as well as in the scientific literature yet, um, but I'm happy to look into that and, and follow up. And of course, Liz, I mean, we did use that as our example in the guide, and we didn't get down to the level of specificity of species of fish. So we, we kind of gave some theoretical higher level examples of how you would think through that and how you would try to link fish habitat changes, you know, improvements to fish habitat to then later measuring whether that does result in higher productivity later. So. There are some examples in the guide because we use that as an example, but um, there would be far more you'd need to do in terms of the level of detail of that um, to, to get down to, you know, real applicability on the ground. If I can just jump in really quickly. This is actually something that came up when we had our very first meetings about the goals that we were going to choose. And because this was an example in the uh, workbook that you guys um, sent through to us, it sort of initiated this discussion that, oh, that's a great idea. Let's, you know, do restoration and we'll restore productivity of fisheries and everything. But then we sat there and said, wow, that's, that's a pretty big goal. And we ended up having a lot of discussion about um, gaps in data that we had and actually that we need to address those first. And um, we did that for every goal as well. So even for the acute disturbances, we sort of were looking through that very systematically and identifying gaps that we have that we need to fill really before we can sort of really push forward with a lot of the restoration and upscaling. So I think um, it's good to have those discussions at the very beginning and having stakeholders that, you know, might have more of a fisheries background or perspective and identifying um, gaps. And we ended up creating this as a goal, it's not one of the goals that we worked through um, the entire process, but we changed it to the perspective of let's restore nursery habitat for a few key reef fish species. So then it got into subsistence fisheries that's really important to us here in American Samoa. So we sort of took some of that, that sort of broader fisheries production, but found a more tangible way that we're at the point where potentially we have enough information and data to sort of restore areas of nursery habitat. So just a different perspective um, for people. Thank you guys. Um, we have a hand up here from, I think it's Umi. Do you wanna ask? I, I was actually gonna get to some of your questions in the question panel, but you have several. So do you wanna ask one of your questions if I unmute you? Umi, are you there? You've got a hand up. Oh, lovely if I can uh, send my question myself uh, to the uh, managers or leaders. Yeah, I was um, just participant in this webinar and I saw the discussion is very, very uh, interesting and very broad and um, in terms of uh, everything about the, uh, the conservations and the uh, restoration of the coral reef and I myself from a fisheries uh, department and I saw there is a lot of things that um, related to what I've done. Uh, I have done some research on the uh, corals ecosystem myself and uh, I saw some problem, this, uh, same, almost same problem in what happened in Indonesia uh, where my um, uh, 
right now, uh, my locations right now. Yeah, all these um, documents that uh, you've discussed is very, very interesting and very deep and broad and uh, very um, uh, advanced. Uh, now, my, uh, but uh, there's a lot of my, in my mind that's also, um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, probably uh, to uh, Georgia and Whitney, um, when we have already uh, set up a planning for a program or something like that, um, how would you uh, um, uh, set an indicators whether uh, your, your your plan is is, is um, success or not, or how many uh, percent that you have already achieved or something like that, and what are you going to do with that? I mean, if you just probably oh oh this objective is um, uh, not yet uh, um, achieved and and will you just think um to do it later uh, or or what are you going to do as a as a manager or as a leader in this um uh activities it was in the, uh, some of my questions <laughs> there are a lot <laughs> of uh, questions that i would like to ask you but i don't know if i uh, have time <laughs> for that i think we'll yeah, do this uh, one question and then we'll try to put the rest on our forum for you so do Georgia or Whitney want to try to answer that about uh, indicators of success? And thank you. I mean, I, I think that's a, a, a really <laughs> excellent question. Um, I, I think what's part of what's in, really important with this process is going through and having your, you know, your smart objectives where things are time bound and measurable and you're able to say, you know, when, when you have a very clear objective, you can very clearly assess whether you met it. And I also think, you know, part of this part of this process is it's designed to be integrated into adaptive management, right? So you can you reevaluate yeah. the plan every couple of year, every year, every couple of years, and you say, what have we accomplished? Where are gaps? Where are we falling behind? Why? And try to revise it. So really have it as like as a living document um, to kind of go back and change it as you need to, so that you can be successful. Excellent, yeah. How, how about in Samoa, Georgia? Georgia, yeah, great. go oh. one minute. One minute, great question. So I think um, seeing this uh, plan as a living document, so as Whitney said, you can go back and change things and realize what doesn't work and what does work. It's not set in stone. And the other thing is having metrics. And you. so for us in Samoa, American Samoa, we're using this as the first few years as a pilot study to really look at what techniques work, what species work, and how we can measure that success and also measure failures. And then we'll go back, revise the plan, take the lessons that we learned, and then keep moving forward and upscaling. So we're at the beginning stages, very much pilot studies, and it's all a learning process. Okay, well, we uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you. We are out of time for our webinar today, but I want to thank um, all of the leads and authors on this guide. This has been a huge process that everybody has invested in with a lot of goodwill and volunteering. And I can't thank everybody enough for everything that you've done through your authorship of the guide and mentorship of the sites and collaboration. It's truly been a great partnership and um, I am excited to have more people use this resource and let us know how it goes. We're going to post this recording on the Reef Resilience Toolkit. It's going to go out to everybody who attended. Please share it widely. Check out the forum for some of the questions we didn't get to and everybody I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.